Could a gunshot wound to the back of the head be considered suicide? On the evening of her New Year's Eve gathering, a mother of three was joyous, laughing and dancing alongside her husband Tom in their living room while indulging in jello shots. However, a tense altercation with her parents ensued, leading to a heated dispute between Ashley and Tom. The arguing escalated, resulting in Tom dialing for an ambulance as Ashley sustained a gunshot wound. In Colorado, Tom and Ashley Fallis were hosting a family-friendly party for New Year's Eve in 2011. Jenna Fox and Joe Ragudin left their daughter's home on Zinfandel just past 12.30 a.m. It had been a fun night filled with drinks, games, and dancing. However, shortly after ringing in the new year, the atmosphere at the party took a sour turn. Ashley had informed her husband that she was stepping outside with her family for a smoke, although she didn't intend to smoke a cigarette. An argument erupted between the young couple, unfolding in front of Ashley's family who were the only remaining guests at the house. Just an hour earlier, they had danced affectionately to their favorite song, watched adoringly by their guests. But now, the frustrations of their marriage were fully on display. Less than 10 minutes after leaving the party, Joe and Jenna turned their car around and returned to the house. They were drawn back by a stream of emergency vehicles and police cruisers, all rushing past them to the very house they had just left. When they arrived, their daughter had already been hurried into an ambulance. Ashley had sustained a single gunshot wound to the head. To her parents, shocked and heartbroken by the scene, it was clear what had occurred in the few minutes after they had left the house. Their son-in-law, Tom Fallis, had shot their daughter in an angry rage. Ashley and Tom had a tough day before their friends came over. When everyone left, they started arguing again in the bedroom. What began as a small fight turned into a big one. Tom said Ashley used bad words towards him. She told him she would do whatever she pleased. Tom replied saying okay, but not because her family told her to. While they were still arguing, Tom was getting his pajamas from the closet when he heard Ashley move around. She kept her gun, a Taurus 9mm, under the mattress on the other side of the bed. He started to ask, What are you doing? But couldn't finish because he heard the gunshot. Tom and Ashley met on a dating website in 2007. Ashley was a big personality, energetic and talkative, and Tom liked her immediately. She was already a single mom at 24. Tom and Ashley had a son together and got married. Tom also adopted Ashley's two girls. By 2012, their kids were 9, 6, and 3. Their son had health issues, causing stress. Ashley lost her job in 2010 due to a disagreement. She had an affair and struggled with anxiety. Despite problems, they stuck together. Ashley found out she might be pregnant again, but then had a miscarriage on New Year's Eve 2011. They considered reversing a previous procedure to have more kids. Ashley seemed fine at a party that night, but Tom felt something was off. Later, Ashley was found dead and Tom was accused of killing her. The Evans Police Department quickly asked the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, CBI, for help after a call. Ashley's family accused Tom Fallis, claiming he was angry and had a bad temper when they left the house. At first, it seemed Ashley hurt herself, but some clues suggested there might have been a struggle. They found divorce papers on a dresser, hunting things that weren't good at home. Tom Fallis was questioned by the police. They saw scratches on him, which could show a fight before Ashley died. Tom said he got the scratches from shaving for the first time. He explained what happened that day, from a pregnancy test to an argument about following family advice. After Tom told his story, the detective asked him again to explain what happened. But when he talked about how fast the shooting happened and tried to explain the scratches on his body, the Evans PD didn't just believe him right away. Things got tense during the interview. While Tom was at the police station, investigators were at his house asking around the neighborhood. They found people who said they heard Tom and Ashley arguing before the gun went off. One witness, a 16-year-old girl named Chelsea Arrigo, said she heard Ashley yelling, Get off me! again and again. When Tom came in for questioning, his wife was still getting urgent help. Sadly, Ashley died not long after, while Tom was still being questioned. Four days after Ashley Fallis was shot, her death was said to be a suicide. The lab hadn't finished checking everything collected in the investigation by the CBI, but the medical examiner still decided it was suicide. Two months later, the case was closed. Ashley's family was heartbroken, confused, and mad. 
They thought the investigators made up their minds too fast. They thought maybe Tom, who worked in law enforcement, got special treatment because of his job. But Tom worked for a different part of law enforcement than the ones investigating. He didn't know the people involved, and the CBI got involved quickly. Still, mistakes happened. Tom wasn't kept away from possible witnesses at the scene, and his hands weren't protected to save evidence like gunshot residue. Sa Ashley's family also had concerns about the police interrogation. They argued that three hours might be appropriate for some cases, but it was certainly insufficient when questioning the prime suspect in a murder investigation. In many ways, Tom Fallis was not treated as a suspect until Jenna and Joe insisted at the scene, prompting the Weld County sheriffs to change their approach. However, even after this change, there was little follow-through, and Tom Fallis was allowed to leave freely. Tom gathered his belongings, along with his three children, and embarked on a move out of state. He chose Indiana as his new destination to be nearer to his sister and pursue a bachelor's degree at university. It seemed Tom was eager for a fresh start. Meanwhile, his former in-laws persisted in their quest for justice. Jenna and Joe took their cause to the media, participating in interviews with both local and national platforms. They openly discussed Tom Fallis's temper, reminisced about Ashley's zest for life, and acknowledged her use of mood stabilizers, attributing it to the strains within her marriage. Her husband's rage often fueled emotional instability. The investigative reporter, Justin Joseph, from Fox 31 News, delved into the case, uncovering a crucial witness. 17-year-old Nick Glover. Living next door to the Fallis family on Zinfandel Street, Nick recounted overhearing Tom Fallis confessing to shooting his wife on January 1st, 2012. Despite Nick's assertion of reporting this to Detective Michael Yates of the Evans Police Department during his interview on that same day, no record of such statements existed. These revelations intensified accusations of bias and corruption within the Evans Police Force. Many perceived Detective Yates as complicit in a cover-up, aimed at shielding a colleague from imprisonment. In April 2014, a full two years following Ashley Fallis' demise, the Evans PD opted to re-examine the possibility of her murder. Allegations pointed towards the officer's suppression of crucial witness statements and manipulation of key testimonies, allegedly to bolster the suicide narrative. In 2014, Tom Fallis faced arrest outside his Indiana home. Asserting his innocence, he prepared for trial to contest the second-degree murder accusation. With the assistance of investigative strides by Fox 31 reporter Justin Joseph, media scrutiny surrounding the case surged to unprecedented levels. Tom Fallis had obtained the Taurus 9mm pistol, owned by his wife and kept under the mattress on her side of the bed. During a struggle, he held the gun to the side of her head. After firing, he lowered her to the ground and called 911. The lawyers started their case by having Jenna Fox talk about how her son-in-law acted angrily and dangerously at the New Year's party. She said they argued earlier about him swearing in front of the kids. Tom said this argument didn't happen. Then they asked Jenna about her family's past mental health problems. Her mom and brother died by shooting themselves. Ashley's doctor said Ashley wasn't depressed. During cross-examination, the doctor discovered that Ashley had been secretly seeing two psychiatrists along with her primary care doctor, resulting in her receiving double prescriptions without anyone's knowledge. At the trial, forensic investigator Dan Gilliam, who had spent around 400 hours analyzing evidence, testified that Tom Fallis likely didn't shoot Ashley, despite being called as a witness for the prosecution. Gilliam noted that in his extensive experience in law enforcement and forensic analysis, Individuals who shoot in a fit of rage typically don't stop after one shot. Forensic analyst Jonathan Priest testified that he spent approximately 25 to 35 hours working on the case, examining about 3,000 pages of documents, photos, and other materials, and visiting the scene. He concluded that Tom was likely near or even touching Ashley when the gun discharged. Priest argued that if Tom had truly been across the room as he claimed, there would have been more blood at the scene considering the time it would have taken for him to reach Ashley and apply pressure on her wound before responders arrived. The proof they collected didn't support the idea that Tom killed his wife. They checked Tom's hands for gun stuff but found none. However, there was gun stuff on Ashley's hands. Even though Tom had scratches on his chest, there was no trace of Ashley's DNA on him. 
They also checked under Ashley's nails, but didn't find Tom's DNA there either. These findings made it uncertain if there was a fight. The prosecution's argument relied heavily on a new witness, Nick Glover, who said he heard Tom confess. This became even more important when another witness, Chelsea Arrigo, couldn't remember hearing the argument between Tom and Ashley that night. Chelsea had previously told Nick's mom that she heard Ashley yelling, but when she was asked in court, she said she was too drunk to remember anything. Nick got more support from another person who came forward during the investigation. This was three years later. Chris Graves, who used to work as a sheriff's deputy, said he heard Tom Fallis admit to the murder right after the police arrived at the house. Tom's lawyers pointed out that there were many people around, but no one else heard Tom confess, even though he supposedly yelled it out. They also wondered why Chris Graves waited three years to report what he heard. During questioning, the interrogator asked Chris why he didn't arrest Tom when he heard him confess. Chris explained it wasn't his job at that moment. The interrogator asked if Chris ever wrote a report about what he heard, but he hadn't. Chris was then asked why he got fired from the sheriff's office in 2015, and he said it was because of this case. He was fired for not being truthful about it. Tom Fallis chose not to testify during his trial. The trial lasted for weeks and involved more than 40 witnesses. In their closing arguments, Tom's lawyers talked about Ashley Fallis's mental state. They mentioned expert opinions that showed problems in her life before her death, like pregnancy issues, her child's sickness, medication, losing her job, and having an affair. They also brought up two notes Ashley wrote to Tom, in which she apologized and called herself a failure. Ashley's family wondered how these notes, which they didn't know about, suddenly appeared years after her death, seeming convenient for Tom's defense. After about three and a half hours of deliberation, with a lunch break in between, the jury found Tom Fallis not guilty of second-degree murder and any related charges. Jennifer Fox and Joe Ragadin sued the Evans Police Department and investigators, saying evidence was tampered with and left out. They argued that Detective Yates didn't include statements from Nick Glover on New Year's Day 2012, and that other deputies near Tom Fallis must have heard what Deputy Chris Graves did but didn't say anything. However, their case was dismissed. Despite the jury's decision, the family still believes Tom Fallis is guilty and is devastated by the jury's verdict. They have visitation rights for the three children and are still involved in their lives. Tom Fallis has struggled to pay off the huge legal bills from his defense since being found not guilty. He's also gone back to studying. Tom has told his children their mother had an accident and plans to explain more when they're older. For more stories like this, follow and subscribe to our channel.